Um, before I say anything else, I just want to say to all the performers today that you are awesome and awesomely talented. Um, I got very nostalgic and um, teary listening to that, that piano piece, so thank you for that. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I've really been looking forward to it and thinking about what I wanted to say and I had ideas and um, I sat down to organize my thoughts and put them on paper and, and uh, when I was happy with the first draft, I sat down to time it and it was three minutes long. <laughs> I need to learn the art of elaboration. So here goes. I, um, I grew up in Sugarland. I was the very shy fourth child of five, um, who was born into a wonderfully loud, opinionated, and talented family. Then I had a profound moment in junior high when I realized that if I was doing a play, while I was up there talking, everyone else was going to be very quiet and listen. <laughs> it, was, it was powerful, and I was, I was hooked. My wonderful mother had done a lot of research and found HSPBA, and uh, I had a brother and a sister before me who attended, and she stayed up late into many nights working on my audition pieces, and I got in. And the stopwatch of my artistic life started spinning, and it, and it hasn't stopped yet. I, um, I can remember as clear as day the first acting class that Suzanne Phillips taught when she joined the faculty my junior year. I sat there listening to her with big, fat, hot tears running down my face because I knew she was going to teach us. You know, she was going to give us tools that I would be using for the rest of my life. And uh, I thought I would share some of, those, some of those tools with you. These five ideas are, are my tent poles. They are the kind of Stones I go back to in my work now, they define how I think about storytelling and also how I think about life because it's impossible to untangle the creating of a story and the actual living of your life. And the seeds of all of these ideas were planted here at HTPA. The first of these ideas is you, each of you, are uniquely and infinitely interesting. You, in your simplest state, are more watchable and lovable than anything that you can fabricate. Don't hide. Bring your unguarded self to the conversation. Be open to the experience. Number two, everyone in the room with you is also uniquely <laughs> and infinitely interesting. <laughs> Be generous with them. Be curious about them. Look for your answers in them. Number three, have a very strong and specific point of view about the room that you're about to walk in, about the people that are going to be in that room, about what, to, what you hope to get from that experience. And that's true for the character, whatever character that you're developing, but it's also true for the actor or whomever. If you're clear about the goal, you're more likely to achieve it. Number four, don't lie. No matter what your expectations were, how you thought it should or hoped it would go, once you're in the room, be where you are and tell the truth. The truth is always more surprising and interesting than a lie. And finally, be very, very brave. Jump off the cliff. Surprise yourself. After high school and some college, I packed up these mantras and a bag of clothes and bought a one-way bus ticket to New York City. I had never been there, and when I stepped off the bus at Port Authority at 11 o'clock at night, <laughs> surprisingly, I was sure I had found my home. <laughs> at least for that chapter of my life. <laughs> um, I worked first in an unheated theater box office where I had to wear a scarf and gloves while taking ticket orders over the phone. I felt very bohemian in New York. I was there for a while, and once the luster wore off of that, I moved off on to working at a French bistro where I felt connected to the timelessness of food and cash money at the end of the night. <laughs> 
uh, and all the while I was taking acting classes and doing little tiny plays for no money in 30 seat basement theaters in New York. And finally, I got an agent! <laughs> And after a one-line part on Sex and the City, in which I said, it's very good. <laughs> I was talking about a bagel, I was like. <laughs> but I filled it with as much attitude as I could. <laughs> so after that glowing moment, I, um, my first big job in New York City was understudying for this very old-fashioned Arthur Lorenz play uh, called The Time of the Cuckoo. And because my life is a little bit charmed, I got to go on with 20 minutes notice and no rehearsal, the very first performance after opening night, a Wednesday matinee that the poor actress forgot about. <laughs> um, and because it was the middle of the day, matinee, that meant that Lincoln Center offices were full of artistic directors and casting directors and etc. who ran down to the theater when they heard to see how I would get on. And it went up. Except for not being able to pick up any of my props for the first 15 minutes because my hands were shaking like this. <laughs> Otherwise, it went very, very well. Which meant that a year later, when Tom Stoppard was bringing his American uh, premiere of The Invention of Love to Broadway with Lincoln Center, they called me in. And I was given the only female role in a cast of 25 men. <laughs> if you ever get in the, the chance to sit in a room with Tom Stoppard and have him explain anything to you, Take it. Intelligence like that is never boring. It is humbling and inspiring. And it was also not boring to be in a cast of 25 cute, talented men. <laughs> um, I was 25 years old. I'd been in the city for four years. And after feeling relief and gratitude, my next very naive um, thought about getting a job was, well, it is about time. Um, because for me, there was, there was no backup plan. It was be successful as an actor or the romance of steak fruit salad. There was really no alternative. I'm a very, very lucky girl. I spent six more years in New York and uh, doing regional theater, having lots of fantastic experiences, but I think the pinnacle of which was, um, as our wonderful NCs mentioned, working on the revival of Edward Albee's Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf with Kathleen Turner, Bill Irwin, and David Harper. Edward Albee knows every syllable of that play, literally. He would sit in rehearsal with his eyes closed and listen to it like it was a piece of music, and then he would give us notes based on that music. I had this huge laugh in the middle of the second act, and somewhere in the middle of our six-month run, the laugh went away. That happens sometimes. You just inexplicably lose a laugh. And the harder I tried to get it back, the more tragically unfunny it became. <laughs> I was like banging my head against the wall backstage. And Edward came to see the show again during this time and very generously came backstage after that act to find me, to tell me that if I took a pause before the uh, I would get my laugh back. So I very obediently did what he said, and Mr. Albee was right. Yeah, amazing. I have um, a priceless postcard tucked away with Edward's scribbling hand that says, nobody's ever done honey better. And getting that was, was bliss. Um, so we did the show for six months in New York, and then we took it to the West End for four months. Between rehearsals and out-of-town trials and uh, break for the holidays, I've been telling that story for a year and a half. It was a long time to tell one story, and I definitely felt up for a different adventure, so I moved myself to Los Angeles. Um, three seasons of big love, a wedding, and a black belt in Taekwondo later. <laughs> I got an audition for a new little show on AMC called The Killing. First audition went great, second audition went better, 
encouraging emails were coming in from, from casting directors and the director to, to keep my faith while they went about their process. And then silence, and then more silence. And what they didn't know was that I was already expecting our daughter. It was the middle of pilot season. I was doing a farce with Annette Benning at the Geffen Theater in Los Angeles and auditioning for two and three new shows a day. I was in the middle of first trimester exhaustion. I would get to the theater early so I could like crash on the couch in the green room before I had to get ready. And the cast was really starting to wonder what was wrong with me. Um, and those jerks at the killing were not calling. And um, I finally had this dinner with my husband where I said, look, I just have to ask you, I mean, I think I know the answer, but I just, I just have to ask you, like, does it worry you that I am going on all of these auditions and I'm not getting cast and now I'm pregnant and I will probably never work again? <laughs> and he said he was not worried about me. <laughs> and um, the next day the killing called back and said, would I mind terribly coming in a third time? Which I did and they offered me to test and then, and then it was mine. So I shot that pilot from four to five months pregnant. The show got picked up. I had my daughter. And then at seven weeks, we packed her and our little family in a car and drove up to winter Vancouver. It was 42 and gray every day for five months. <laughs> my adorable husband sat in the trailer all day with the baby while I ran back and forth between shooting in the rain and feeding her. I worked 14 hour days and was up every two hours with her and learning lines and doing 2 a.m. ab workouts. Uh, my husband frequently told me I was out of my head, but if it doesn't kill you, it definitely makes you stronger. Um, uh, oh yes, during, so during that, that first season, I, when I read this to my husband, he was horrified I was telling this story, and he actually said, I didn't do that, I didn't do that. <laughs> That whole period is a blur, but <laughs> this is a true story. Um, my husband very accidentally lost my wedding ring in a dark and wet parking lot on our anniversary. <laughs> and he was horrified, and all I could say was, who cares about the ring? Look what we're doing, and we still like each other. <laughs> that was success. <laughs> Uh, in the three years between then and now, it has been unrelenting, wild, and amazing ride. We've raised our daughter, shot three seasons of The Killing, uh, shot six very different feature films in uh, nine different cities and five different countries. Um, I've attended premieres in Los Angeles, and New York, and Toronto, and London. Um, I went to the Tonys, and the Emmys, and the Golden Globes, which were wonderful, except for the possibility of winning and having to actually stand up and give a speech, which makes me want to throw up. <laughs> but luckily I didn't win. <laughs> and I had a very nice time. <laughs> I've gotten to work with amazing people um, that were mentioned before. Joel Kinnaman, Josh Brolin, Brad Pitt, Colin Firth, Ryan Reynolds, Sam Worthington, the young Chloe Moretz, and dozens and dozens of others, and if you add being married to Alan Ruck, my life is arguably an embarrassment of riches. But it has been a long and steady journey. I am 24 year in the making of overnight success, <laughs> which has brought me to these conclusions. I don't want to be a homicide detective, but I'm very grateful there are other people who do. <laughs> Zombies are very scary. <laughs> I make a pretty good um, Courtney Love look-alike, which you can see in my very sweet upcoming movie, If I Stay. It's out in August with Chloe Moretz. She's a lovely girl. About the age of our students. She's 16 years old and is remarkable. Um, and finally, whether you're in a 30-seat basement theater or you're making a $200 million movie, the work is the same. It's still a group of people showing up with some words to say and trying to figure out the best way to tell the story. It's still hope and teamwork and bravery. 
the tools that, that our kids are learning at 14 years old in these rooms are the ones that they will need no matter where their road takes them. I still get moved when I think about the riches of, of my high school experience at such a critical time of life when the world is a mass of questions and tumult to be offered the opportunity of such focus, to have your esteem tied directly to effort and progress, to be given a place of belonging that is based on things of worth is invaluable. Because these kids are not only our future artists, they're future parents and teachers and citizens helping to foster happy, intelligent, self-confident thinking and hardworking people is always worth it. You need only step into the halls of the school to know that it's true. That heartbreaking combination of effort and hope and potential is as palpable there as the forces of the sea. Thank you so much for believing in this program, which is so close to my heart, and thank you for inviting me to spend the afternoon with you. You guys are the heroes. Thank you.